Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. Not many days after the Peloponnesians' arrival in Attica, the plague first began to show itself among the Athenians. It was said that it had broken out in many places previously, in the neighbourhood of Lemnos and elsewhere, but a pestilence of such extent and mortality was nowhere remembered. Thucydides Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 76, The Plague of Athens. We have now witnessed the events of the first year of the Peloponnesian War. We saw that Sparta had gone into the conflict with a traditional approach to warfare between two Greek city-states, where a side would focus on the fields around the enemy's city, threatening their supply of food. This would usually induce the other side to march out and meet the enemy on open ground, where they would engage in combat that would usually produce a result that day. This may have been a sure enough tactic when involving smaller city-states of the Archaic period. However, times were changing, with Athens and Sparta being two of the most powerful polis currently. The systems that Athens had put in place to defend themselves against this very sort of strategy was far more complex, and not limited to just the geographical area of Attica. Athens now had a vast empire and trade network, which allowed it to remain supplied during times of war. While its impressive long walls would prove to be an enormous hurdle to an invading army. Archidamus had recognised the weakness in Sparta's plans, even before war broke out, though when the majority of Sparta were against his advice, he would still leave the Peloponnesian army when war broke out, even if he did drag his feet. By the end of the first campaigning season, his arguments were starting to be vindicated, though the Spartan war party would still continue to see this offensive approach as the right path to victory. While remaining behind their walls in Athens, on the defensive, a naval campaign would be launched by the Athenians, with the intention of harassing the Peloponnesian coast. This would also see that new allies would be obtained from areas around the Peloponnese, which would prove useful as the war would drag on. As the cooler months started approaching, the fleet would return to Athens, but before doing so, they would join in a large raid into the lands around Megara. The Peloponnesians had also departed Attica, with the various contingents returning to their cities for the winter. We would then find in the historical record that the close of the first year would be marked by a speech given by Pericles, known as Pericles' funeral oration. It had become tradition that the fallen in war would be celebrated in a funeral procession at the end of the campaigning season, with then a public Athenian figure addressing the people. The address that Pericles would deliver was designed to install pride and honour to the Athenian people, celebrating the achievements of their city. It would show to those left behind that the fallen had not died in vain, but had sacrificed themselves for a greater good. While, in the end, it would convince the Athenians that continuing the struggle was worth the continued hardships. In this episode, we will be continuing on with the events as the Peloponnesian War entered its second year. We will see similar approaches by both Sparta and Athens, where the Peloponnesian army would once again invade Attica. However, Archidamus would campaign with much more vigour this time around, while Athens would once again launch its fleet, directing it at the Peloponnese, though this time targeting larger polis. However, Athens would suffer a major blow during the second year. The plague would begin to appear in Athens early in the season and would take hold as the year progressed. As we had seen, Pericles had been able to weather the storm of opinion that had been going against him during the first year of the war. It would seem that the operations that the Athenians did arrange along with its diplomatic achievements would have helped smooth tensions a bit. I think it would be safe to assume that it would have been these activities Pericles would have made sure were being talked about in public circles. One would think too that the funeral procession and his speech would have also helped see feelings against his policy die down to a degree. The Spartans were no longer in Attic soil, and a great deal of the heightened stress would now subside with the coming of the cooler months. Pericles' funeral oration would have helped feed into this feeling, 
allowing the citizens of Athens to be convinced that their sacrifice was not in vain, and it was imperative to continue the struggle. There would have no doubt been those who were still opposed to this policy, though it would appear Pericles had been able to retain the support of the majority. Evidence of this would be the re-election of Pericles to general in the late winter or early spring of 430, along with a number of his associates. So these elections had taken place after having experienced the whole of the first year of the war, as well as Pericles' efforts in justifying what Athens had experienced. Pericles, although having seen the opposition that had been growing against him in the previous year, will continue to follow his defensive strategy. Even with the objections that had been raised, it had proved to counter Sparta's offensive approach. Many of the people in the regions of Attica had been able to head to the safety of Athens' walls, along with their property. It had proved to save many out in the deems. Though we will see this episode that it would also lead to a different problem Athens would have to weather. However, Pericles would have also have been mindful of how opinion had grown against him. He was able to offset some of this through the operations that were conducted. If he was going to survive politically through the second year, he would need to also show that Athens was being proactive against the Peloponnesians. As we continue into the episode, we will see he would have another naval campaign launched, though with higher value targets in mind. When it comes to the Peloponnesians, we don't get much of an idea of how they were preparing for the new season of campaigning. We had seen that the Peloponnesian army had disbanded when marching back to the Peloponnese with the various contingents heading home for winter. It would seem that an understanding was in place that the allies of Sparta would once again assemble at the Corinthian Isthmus once winter was over. In Sparta, we just don't know what was being discussed, though it would be interesting to know the discussions around Archidamus' performance in the first year of campaigning. One could imagine the war party seeking to find a way to see command go to a Spartan more enthusiastic in carrying out this strategy. However, Archidamus would retain command of the Peloponnesian army. This could well be due to the tradition of a Spartan king leading the forces in the field. Though, as we will see, Archidamus would conduct the second invasion with much more vigour this time around. We just don't know if politics back in Sparta saw him having to adjust his attitude towards the war. After all, we have seen other prominent Spartans being accused of aiding the enemy, and some exiled. Or it could have been a matter of Archidamus seeing that he had attempted to bring a peaceful resolution to the conflict, had now seen that Athens too was not interested in engaging in talks. He now had no other option if he were to fulfil his role as king, but to carry out his duties as best he could in the interests of his city. As the months began to become warmer, many of the Peloponnesian cities would have been gathering their men and resources. Sparta would have set a place and time for the various allies to meet up on the Corinthian Isthmus so that campaigning could continue into 430, the second year of the war. Through Thucydides, we would see that the assembling of the forces was complete as summer came on, as the Peloponnesian army, with Archidamus at its head, once again would march into Attica in the first days of summer. So, for a second year in a row, the lands of Attica would be invaded by the Peloponnesians, though this year we are told that they would only have two-thirds of the forces as a previous. It's curious that Thucydides points this out, but he does not tell us why this was the case. Here we are left to guess why a smaller force would be sent. One line of thinking could suggest that the actions of the first year had taken a toll on the Peloponnesians. This could have been through the uneventful campaign of the first year. Many of the city-states being enthusiastic with the war just beginning, though the reality of the situation would have set in by the time of the end of the season. Perhaps this could have seen some allies look to commit less men this time around, with the attitudes within these cities waning somewhat. Or maybe the efforts of the first year had taken its toll on the various contingents physically, with less men and resources available to continue the same level of effort as the first year. While perhaps the Athenian operations around the Peloponnese may have seen some less willing to commit the forces of the previous year, wanted to keep some home to respond to any more Athenian incursions. Though, on the other side of the coin, and what I think to be most likely, this reduced force may be completely calculated by the Spartans. Archidamus had seen that the ravaging of Attic countryside was not going to see the Athenian army emerge from the walls. Perhaps it was now judged that a smaller force would only be required to continue the ravaging of Attica. This would then free up more forces for other enterprises, and as we will see in a bit, the Peloponnesians would engage in other operations away from Attica. So this would seem like the most plausible reason 
for this reduced army marching into Attica this time around. However, back to the operations in Attica. Thucydides would tell us that the Peloponnesians would once again lay waste to the plains, once coming out of the Isthmus. After this, they would continue on into the Paralean, this being the region in southern Attica and where the silver mines of Laurion were located. Here they would ravage the lands from coast to coast, but even this action around Athens' most lucrative mine would not see the Athenian army react. This campaign by Archidamus in the second year would be conducted with much more vigour than the first. We would hear that the Peloponnesian army would spend 40 days, more than the previous year, ravaging the lands of Attica. While there were no more delays this time around, Archidamus probably seen that Athens was not interested in diplomacy, now seeing his mind set to the task at hand. In this second year, we would once again see Pericles arrange another naval operation that was to be directed against the Peloponnese. We are told by Thucydides that during the early stages of the Peloponnesian invasion, while they were still in the plains coming out of the Isthmus, a fleet of 100 ships was prepared. This time around, the force would be somewhat more substantial, with 4,000 hoplites being sent this time, with Pericles himself leading the expedition. In addition to this, provisions had been made by using old triremes to send a contingent of cavalry, which was 300 strong. The Athenian fleet, once departing, would then be further strengthened, with a total of 50 additional ships coming from Chios and Lesbos. The combined fleet of 150 vessels departed the Piraeus, while the Peloponnesian invasion was just getting underway. They would make a short journey across the Saronic Gulf, where their initial target would be the polis of Epidaurus. This would see that the aims of the naval operation were increasing somewhat, as Epidaurus was a larger polis and partner in the Peloponnesian alliance than the targets of the previous year. However, even with this increase in men and resources, the operation would run into trouble against Epidaurus. Thucydides would write on the expedition. Arriving at Epidaurus, in the Peloponnese, they ravaged most of the territory, and even had hopes of taking the city by assault. In this, however, they were not successful. They laid waste to the territory of Trozen, Halias, and Harmony, all cities on the coast of the Peloponnese, and thence sailing to Prasea, a maritime city in Laconia, ravaged part of its territory, and took and sacked the place itself, after which they returned home but found the Peloponnesians gone and no longer in Attica. Here we get an account on how the operation unfolded, though we don't get much in the way of reasons and explanations of what had taken place. We also see here that geographically speaking, the scope of this campaign was much more contained than the first year. However, perhaps its intentions had grander aims, with it targeting a larger polis and setting out with a land force over four times larger than the year before. So, what were the aims of this expedition of 430? There are two main thoughts along what was taking place on the Argolid. The first sees Pericles intended to capture Epidaurus and hold it as a base to support or encourage Argos into action against Sparta. The second view sees his action as being a continuation of the raids and plundering of the first year, but able to target more powerful city-states. So if we first turn to the idea around capturing Epidaurus, this seems like a reasonable assumption. It was fairly close to Athens' port, where it would be able to be supported. The capture of the city would have seen Athens in control of a location close by one of Sparta's fiercest opponents on the Peloponnese, Argos. This may have encouraged them to take action and disrupt Peloponnesian activities within. However, if we look a little deeper, it may appear this was not the intention at all. We had seen over and over again, since even before war broke out, Pericles had warned against expanding the Athenian Empire in times of war. This previously had led to Athens overextending itself. If Athens had captured the city, they would then be required to hold it against the Peloponnesian force that would return from their invasion of Attica. This would see a large number of Athenian resources tied up with trying to hold one location. So in short, this would see a sudden change in Pericles' policy that held firm for many years. And as we have seen, he was not in the habit of acting on impulse. Another point that perhaps shows that the capture of the city was not the aim in itself, was the way that the Athenian force went about doing it. We have talked about how assaulting a walled city was a difficult enough task in itself, but to give your opponent ample warning would have made it so much harder. If the Athenians had their sights set on the capture of Epidaurus, why would they spend the time ravaging the lands around the city 
giving plenty of warning to their presence before making an attempt to assault the city. So it might seem that the second view on this expedition may have been what Pericles had in mind, though with it not panning out the way he would have liked. Pericles had seen from the previous year the fleet being able to ravage the coasts of a number of regions, while also plundering some cities. However, it appears the plundering of cities was more of an opportunistic venture rather than what the fleet had been tasked with. But seeing that the force was able to do this, perhaps it then factored into Pericles' thinking to undermine the enemy on their own soil and approve opinion on his own policy at home. As Plutarch says, Pericles undertook the expedition against Epidaurus because he wanted to cure these ills and also because he wanted to do some harm to the enemy. That larger force was needed as Pericles was targeting more powerful cities. Once the ravaging around Epidaurus was complete, perhaps it was judged that an attempt to plunder the city as well was well worth a shot, since many of the fighting men of Epidaurus would have been amongst the Peloponnesian forces currently in Attica. If it was successful, it would have been a blow to the morale of one of Sparta's largest allies while also giving Athens a morale boost. Pericles was well aware of the importance of this due to his experience of the first year. We then saw, after failing to take Epidaurus, Pericles would lead the forces to continue ravaging other areas. However, this appears to have been the plan all along, as it continued the pattern of the raids of the first year. If Athens captured Epidaurus, they probably would have not had the resources to effectively carry out the continued destruction of Peloponnesian lands. Also, limiting the destruction to one region would only have limited impact, with only one of the Peloponnesian allies affected. If the destruction could be spread out, it would impact more of the cities within the Peloponnesian League. Though, with such a large force for the year, why were these activities only limited to the Argolis before returning to Athens? Given the scope of the previous year, it would seem this force could have inflicted more damage on a wider area. Well, we had seen that the Peloponnesians would remain in Attica for 40 days. The Athenian fleet had set out after they had already entered Athenian territory. So, with a lack of explanation, we could perhaps look to the line Thucydides told us about the fleet returning home, where they found the Peloponnesians gone and no longer in Attica. This perhaps gives us the indication that Pericles may have been aware of the Peloponnesians marking back to the Corinthian Isthmus. Even though his force was larger than the previous year, it would still have been no match if the returning Peloponnesian force was able to catch them during their activities on the Peloponnese. However, there is another reason that may have seen Pericles cut short the naval campaign, and this might have had to do with the political situation back in Athens due to the plague that had now taken hold in the city, which we will get to shortly. Before we turn to the plague that would break out in Athens, let's first look to the activities that Sparta would direct outside Attica. These activities would take place towards the end of the summer, at a time where Athens was dealing with the full effects of the plague, while also conducting a campaign to Potidaea, which we will be focusing on next episode. This departing from the main effort, the war party, set out at the opening of the war. Though, there would be no mistake that it was the war party that was still calling the shots, this being clear when we look at Athens' attempts at engaging in talks towards the end of the year. This we will be discussing in greater detail next episode. It appears that Sparta was looking to respond to the earlier naval operations of the Athenians, as a fleet of 100 triremes would carry 1,000 hoplites and would sail for Zaknithos, an island to the northwest of the Peloponnese where the opening of the Corinthian Gulf was located. If you recall, Athens had conducted operations in this region the previous year, where a number of islands and cities were added to the Athenian alliance. Zakynthos had as a population people from a Peloponnesian origin, but were currently in an alliance with Athens. This Peloponnesian fleet would descend on the island and would set about ravaging the countryside. However, the 1,000 hoplites that landed on the island were not strong enough to force the island to submit to the Peloponnesian League, which would see the fleet return to the Peloponnese without turning the island. Although this action deviated away from the main focus of ravaging Attica, it's easy to understand why the Spartans would launch the operation. Athens had shown that even though their lands were being invaded by the best part of the Peloponnesian armies, they were still able to respond and inflict damage on those within the Spartan alliance. If Sparta allowed this to carry on unchecked, their allies around the Peloponnese, who were vulnerable to the Athenian navy, would start to lose confidence. This was not an entirely new effort though, 
as during the previous winter, Corinth had attempted to counter some of the Athenian gains in Arcania and the island of Cephalonia with mixed results. However, we also need to remember this type of campaigning was not completely at odds with the proposed way Sparta looked to run their war against Athens. We had seen in the addresses made in the Spartan assembly that one of the strategies they proposed to employ was to sail against the allies of Athens and encourage revolt. Though, for now, these operations do not appear to be taking place in any sort of offensive capacity. They appear to be more of a response to Athens' activities. However, as we look to events during the winter next episode, we will see further attempts at influencing Athens' allies, and even those outside the alliance, which could be viewed more offensive in nature. Hi there, are you after more Casting Through Ancient Greece episodes and would like to support the show? Well, I have some good news for you. Over on Patreon, a new bonus episode is released every month where we look in more detail over topics that we have covered in the series so far. In this bonus series, we travel back to the earliest times of Greek history, where we then move forward picking out interesting themes and topics to delve deeper into. This is also an opportunity for supporters to help drive what we cover in these bonus episodes. We have just wrapped up a series of episodes looking at different elements around the Ionian Revolt. Now we are heading into the phase of the Greek and Persian War, where we'll have many new angles to view this conflict from. So if you have been enjoying the series, would like to support the show and gain access to ad-free, early access episodes, plus bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page and supporting the show. Let's now get back to the episode. So, let's now turn to the terrible situation that would break out in Athens during the second year of the war. Thucydides would record that it would not be long into the campaigning season of 430 where plague would start to be detected amongst the Athenians within the walls of Athens. Thucydides would report that he had heard that the signs of the plague had been reported previously around the island of Lemnos, though it would not have the same impact there. He would also comment on the origins of the plague though would point out that he would leave the finding out of its origins and causes to others. There were a couple of common theories on its origins floating around in his days. One speaking of it originating in Ethiopia and then moving into Egypt and Libya, while another would see that the disease was the result of the Peloponnesians poisoning the reservoirs of the Piraeus, since this is where it would be seen to initially make an appearance. However, most historians today seem to think it was most likely imported into Athens, possibly from Africa, due to Athens' extensive trade network, while this would also explain why it was detected earlier within the Aegean, being part of the Athenian Empire and would first show up in the Piraeus, where all the trade ships would put in at. Though I want to just touch on some previous prophecies, as the Greeks liked to turn to these whenever disaster struck to attempt to understand what was happening to them. Thucydides would say that the old men of Athens would recall a verse which had been uttered long ago, though from where we don't know. It would run, A Dorian war shall come, and with it, pestilence. However, there would be disagreement over what word finished the verse, one meaning disease, or one citing famine. Though there would be yet another prophecy in more recent times that the Athenians would look to showing that they had been warned. However, this one was delivered to the Spartans, so only a few within Athens were aware of it. The Spartans had asked the oracle before deciding on war with Athens if they should fight. The answer they received, if they put their might into it, victory would be theirs, and that he would himself be with them. If you recall back to Homer's Iliad, it was Apollo who inflicted plague on the Greeks outside of Troy, and food for thought was the fact it broke out just as the Peloponnesians entered Attica and the plague would not affect the Peloponnesians in any meaningful way. And remembering here that Delphi was a sanctuary of Apollo. Though Thucydides himself doesn't appear to be swayed by prophecies and oracles when reporting historical facts, he just notes this as becoming part of the frenzy as the city sought answers. However, where Thucydides is extremely valuable in understanding the plague of Athens is in his own personal experience as he would come to contract it while he would also witness how it affected Athens and society around him. 
One can imagine the fear and uncertainty that would develop as the plague first showed up in Athens and began to spread. Thucydides would say, At the beginning, the doctors were quite incapable of treating the disease because of their ignorance of the right methods. In fact, mortality among the doctors was the highest of all, since they came more frequently in contact with the sick. Not was any other human art of science of any help at all. Equally useless were prayers made in the temples, consultations of oracles, and so forth. Indeed, in the end, people were so overcome by their sufferings that they paid no further attention to such things. Thucydides would first go about describing the symptoms of the plague for the benefit of those in the future, where he would say, perhaps it may be recognised by the student, if it should ever break out again. As I said, Thucydides would contract the plague, while he would also witness many other sufferings with it, and it is from these experiences that he would describe the symptoms. He would go on to outline the whole myriad of unpleasant afflictions that would make up this combined suffering behind Athenian walls. Thucydides would tell us that people in good health would all of a sudden be affected with the early symptoms, these being violent heats in the head and redness and inflammation in the eyes, the inward parts, such as the throat or tongue, becoming bloody and emitting an unnatural and fetid breath. However, this would not be the limit to the suffering that would entail, with Thucydides going on describing what would tend to follow after this initial stage. Sneezing and hoarseness, after which the pain soon reached the chest, and produced a hard cough. When it fixed in the stomach, it upset it, and discharges a bile of every kind named by physicians, insured, accompanied by great distress. With the disease well and truly taking hold within the body, he would then continue to describe the further torment people would suffer. Externally, the body was not very hot to touch, nor pale in its appearance, but reddish, livid, and breaking out into small pustules and ulcers. But internally, it burned so that the patient could not bear to have on him clothing or linen, even of the lightest description, or indeed to be otherwise than stark naked. He would then go on to tell us that by this stage, there was no relieving this feeling, as people would jump into wells and other bodies of water, with it making no difference. They had also developed an unquenchable thirst that couldn't be tamed, no matter how much they drank. All this would develop over seven to eight days, and it would be at this point that many would succumb. However, those who did not, for them the torment would continue. The disease descended further into the bowels, inducing a violent ulceration, there accompanied by severe diarrhoea. This brought on a weakness which was generally fatal. However, not all would succumb to the plague. Thucydides would contract it, but would end up recovering. Though he would say that even those that did recover, it would leave its mark, often people losing fingers and toes, while some became blind or lost their memory. As can be imagined, historians have for a long time now looked to try and propose what disease had caused the plague to break out. The symptoms that Thucydides outlines have been studied carefully against the symptoms of known diseases today. Though with the wide range of symptoms described, many infections have been proposed. Early on, historians had made the connection with the Black Death of Europe, and saw it as a variation of the bubonic plague. With this type of plague even being detected in the DNA of remains of people from the Bronze Age. However, as testing of remains dating back to the period of Athens plague got better, historians have moved away from this as being the cause and now cite diseases such as typhus, smallpox, measles, and toxic shock syndrome among the most likely causes. Inside Athens' walls, the picture was one of despair and fear, with no one sure of how to help those struck down. Supposedly one remedy that would appear to help some would prove to harm others. Even the animals around Athens, such as the birds of prey and dogs within the city, would soon learn to stay away from the dead bodies that were piling up in the streets. Those that did feast on the dead would soon find themselves dying of the disease. Thucydides would say that it was soon observed that no birds of prey would be near the unburied bodies, and not long after that, they were not seen at all, even flying above the city. They would also start to develop a breakdown in compassion and morality, as a plague would spread to the healthy and sick alike, to the pious and those acting on reason just the same. This would start to see those sick being left alone to suffer without any help, as when people remained to assist, 
they too would be struck down and die. Few, knowing this, would still attend the sick through their honour, but would often be the next victim, so eventually there would be no one to attend the growing cases. However, it would be discovered that those who had recovered would be able to work with the sick, as it appeared they were unable to catch the plague again, or at least to the degree of their initial infection. The burial practices of the Athenians would also be upset due to the large numbers of bodies piling up. Many of the carefully observed rites were dispensed with, and those left standing would deal as best they could. Thucydides would tell us that it wasn't uncommon for people to hijack someone else's funeral pyre, or for bodies to be thrown onto a pyre of a stranger's that had already been lit. Lawlessness and extravagance would also follow, with it seeing that being of good character or bad, and of being rich or poor, had no bearing on one being spared by the plague. Having seen so many rich men die with their wealth still intact, many now sought to live in the moment, enjoying themselves, spending all they could in pursuit of this, while to act in a moral and honourable way were not seen as the virtues as before. The aim was to enjoy oneself while they could before the plague would carry them off too. As Thucydides says, fear of gods or law of man, there was none to restrain them. As we pointed out earlier, it appeared that the plague had presented itself in other areas around the Mediterranean, but it wouldn't have the same disastrous consequences as it would in Athens. No doubt it would have caused suffering in these places, but as Thucydides says, when comparing to what took place in Athens, a pestilence of such extent and mortality was nowhere remembered. So with this in mind, it probably isn't too hard to imagine what caused the situation in Athens to become far more deadly. We are now into the second year of the Peloponnesian War, and the defensive policy of Pericles was neutralising the Spartan offensive actions. Though, as we saw, this policy saw that the population living within Athens itself and the areas contained in the Long Walls were far greater than at any other point in history. As the campaigning season came on, the people from the regions around Attica would travel to Athens with their property to find safety behind its walls, while the Spartans ravaged their lands. This had led to the cramped living conditions within Athens, and would have seen these conditions at their worst during the hotter months, since this was the time that armies marched. Added to this would have been the decrease in sanitation and hygiene, with the city's utility systems, such as wells and drainage, unable to cope with the sudden influx. Highlighting this, and further illustrating the image of what was happening in Athens, the Thucydides would write, An aggravation of the existing calamity was the influx from the country into the city, and this was especially felt by the new arrivals. As there were no houses to receive them, they had to be lodged at the hot season of the year in stifling cabins, where mortality raged without restraint. The bodies of the dying men lay one upon another, and half-dead creatures reeled about the streets and gathered around the fountains in the longing for water. The sacred places also, in which they had quartered themselves, were full of corpses of persons that had died there, just as they were. For as the disaster passed all bounds, men, not knowing what was to become of them, became utterly careless of everything. So, this gives us an introduction to the plague that would enter into Athens. However, it would not vanish as the year came to an end. As we continue our look forward at events, we will see that it would continue to have an impact on the Athenians, with breakouts reoccurring in 429 and the winter of 427-426. By that time, it would be estimated that it would kill up to 75,000 to 100,000 people, around 30% of Athens' total population. Well, the second year of the war was quite an eventful one. However, we are not finished with it yet. So far, we have looked at the recommencement of the Peloponnesian invasion into Attica, where Archidamus would follow through with the ravaging of territory with much more efficiency than the previous year after seeing the Athenians unwilling to negotiate. However, the Athenians would still remain behind their walls and would not come out to engage the Peloponnesians. Athens would also continue the trend of the first year by launching another naval campaign, directed at the Peloponnese, though this time around they would send a much larger force. They would launch these operations on the Argolis, the peninsula on the other side of the Saronic Gulf to the Piraeus. Arguments over the purpose of this operation have been ongoing, though current thinking for the majority of historians today is that this campaign had much the same purpose as the first year, but looking to achieve results on a larger scale. However, as we saw the campaign would be cut short, 
with the ravaging the Athenians engaged in, limited to just the areas around the Peloponnesian League members on the Argolis. Why this was has been explained through perhaps word-reaching Pericles of the Peloponnesian army marching back home, which would risk seeing his smaller force forced into having to engage the much larger Peloponnesian army. Though another highly likely reason was the developing crisis of the plague that had broken out in Athens. Sparta would also engage in naval operations, sending a fleet to the mouth of the Corinthian Gulf. Athens, the previous year, had managed to campaign effectively in this region, bringing a number of new allies under their control. Sparta had to respond, or they would run the risk of their allies on the islands and coastal areas, losing confidence in them. If Athens could campaign against these areas with impunity, then many of these cities would have no choice but to become friendly with Athens. By far and away, the biggest event that took Athens by surprise in the second year was the plague that would break out early in the campaigning season. It isn't entirely certain where it came from or what disease caused it. With it having originated somewhere around the Mediterranean, it isn't surprising to us in hindsight that it would find its way into Athens. The city oversaw an empire that spread out all through the Aegean and relied heavily on the trade networks. This meant Athenian traders, other Greeks and foreigners were constantly interacting in many ports. However, why it would seem to affect Athens more than any other city was due to the policies in place for the Peloponnesian War. Athens was now crammed with people, which it had not seen the like of before. With this leading to the overcrowding and unsanitary living conditions, allowing the plague to spread like wildfire. As we saw, this would lead to a level of suffering unprecedented in Athenian history. Though, unfortunately for Athens, the plague would linger on and reappear over the next few years. So as I have said, even though we have covered a great deal this episode, we still have not touched on everything that was going on in the second year. Next episode, we will turn to the events around the ongoing siege of Potidaea, as Pericles would send another fleet there in the second year. This will also give us the opportunity to look at the diplomatic situation up in Thrace and Macedon, while we will also turn to the crisis of confidence Athens would have in Pericles, with all that was happening within Athens' defensive walls. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series, and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution has truly helped me grow the series. I would like to give a special shout out to two new supporters over on Patreon. A big thank you to Lexi M and Thomas for deciding to sign up and support the series. I truly appreciate it. If you've also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series with episode 77, Further Athenian Adversity.